Today we're going to look at how so many of the formulas in our data booklet have exactly the same form. And so if we understand one, we can understand them all. And this all relates to the slopes and the areas of graphs. What you see in front of you is a whole bunch of the formulas from the IB physics course. Most of them are in your data booklet. They're all essentially definitions. And I like to call them per unit quantities. You'll notice that they're all something divided by something else. So for instance, density here is known as the amount of mass per unit volume. Intensity is the amount of power per unit area. And power is the amount of energy transferred per unit time. You'll notice this first column, they're all per unit time. And when we divide by time like that, we call that a rate. So velocity is the rate of change of displacement. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, etc. Often you'll see a per unit distance. In these two cases, you're dividing by a delta R, a distance, a delta X, a distance. This third column here, we're dividing by a fundamental quantity, such as mass, or charge, or current. In the fourth column here, we're dividing by an area, and in the last column, we're dividing by a volume. But in all cases, the form is the same. So if we understand one of these really well, we're going to understand all of them. And the understanding basically comes right out of grade 9 math. So this isn't going to be anything complex, but it's a very transferable skill. So back in grade nine math, you did all these graphs. You'd have like a y-axis and an x-axis, and then you did straight lines, and you talked about the slopes of those lines. And so you'd talk about a rise and a run, and the rise was equal to delta y, and the run was equal to delta x, and you had this thing called the slope, which was equal to the rise over the run, the delta y over the delta x. Now this equation here is really a per unit quantity equation. It's just like all the other equations that I just showed you. So for instance, one of the equations was power is equal to the change in energy over time. So if you make your x variable time, and you make your y variable energy, then of course your rises are going to be changes in energy. And your runs are going to be time intervals. In other words, power is going to be the slope of an energy time graph. And every one of these quantities you could do the same thing for. You could plot position versus time. The slope would be the velocity. You can plot V versus T, and the slope will be the acceleration. You can plot momentum and time, and the slope will be the force. So the slope of these graphs is really the amount the Y variable changes by per unit change in the X variable. So once we get out of grade 9 math and out of the y and the x and we start renaming these x and y variables so that they're going to be things like energy and time or velocity and time or electric potential and distance, etc. Then we also start getting curves that aren't straight lines. So they might look something like this. Well, the only skill we have is with straight lines. So one of the types of straight lines that we can do is a straight line between any two points on a curve. And of course, that's going to have a rise and a run. In this case, it'd be a change in energy and a change in time. And our slope, which would be the power, will be an average power. What was the average power that was used between the second and 15th second set. So for an average value, we use the slope of what's called the secant. 
between two points. And so that average power is just going to equal that energy interval, the rise divided by the time interval, the run. So one type of a straight line that we can draw is the secant line. We draw it between two points and we use it to calculate an average value. Another type of straight line that we can draw is called a tangent line. So here's a line. There will be some place along this curve where this line is tangential to the curve. And it's probably going to be right about there. And what you'll notice here when we've got it tangent to the curve is that the tangent line and the curve, they hug each other. They stay close together for a, for a kind of an extended duration. So if I just draw an ordinary line, you'll notice that there's almost no duration over which it hugs the curve. So the place where this line would be tangent would be right about here. So we see it hugs the curve for a considerable duration. And that, of course, is because the slope of the tangent line is very close to the slope of the curve at that point. So what we can do with these tangent lines is calculate the slope at a particular time. So we could calculate the slope at those particular times, t1 and t2, and we would find out the power instantaneous at t1, and we'd find out the power instantaneous at t2. So for instantaneous values, we use the slope of the tangent at a point. Let's try an example. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So the first thing you have to do is make sure you've got the right equation. And that equation would be that force is equal to the rate of change of momentum, which means our forces are going to be related to the slopes of this graph. In part A, we want to draw a secant from the point on the curve at one second to the point on the curve at five seconds and we're going to find out the slope of that secant. This point is the point 5 and it seems to be about 38. This point is the point 1 and 10. So our average force between 1 and 5 seconds would be given by the rise over the run, the delta P over the delta T which would be 38, 38 minus 10, all over 5 minus 1, and that'll give 28 over 4, which is 7 newtons. So the average force between 1 and 5 seconds is about 7 newtons. Now what we're going to try to do is find out the instantaneous force at 3 seconds. So we're trying to find out the tangent slope right here. I'm going to draw a, a nice long line that I think has about the right slope there. And then I'm going to move it and see if it hugs the curve nicely. And I'd say I'm just a touch too steep. So I'd say right there that tangent is hugging the curve nicely. So now I need to pick out two points on my tangent. And I'd like to pick out two points that uh, will be really easy to read off the graph and that are well spaced. So this point here seems to go through a grid. That seems to be the point uh, 1.5 and 10. So that's a nice easy point to read off. And I think I'll choose this point here which seems to be at about 4.6 and 50. So my instantaneous force at 3 seconds will be equal to the rise over the run. 
and it rises from 10 to 50, so 50 minus 10. And that took a time of 4.6 minus 1.5. Plug that in, 40 over 3.1 will give a force of 12.9 newtons at three seconds. And of course the tangent is always a bit of an estimate. So if you gave an answer like this on an IB exam, they would accept a range of reasonable values for your slope. So all of those original equations that we had that were all those per unit quantities and they always had a quotient in them and that turned out to be the slope of a graph. We can rewrite them as a product. So instead of writing velocity equals displacement over time, we can write that displacement is equal to velocity times time. And then if we do a graph of the two quantities in the product, it turns out that the quantity on the left side will be related to the area under the graph. In fact, it's going to equal the area under the graph. So in this case, our area under the graph would represent a displacement. And that can be done for all of these equations. We can do a power versus time graph. And the area under the power versus time graph will represent the energy. We can do a force versus displacement graph. And the area under that graph will be equal to the work being done. So why is it that the area under the graph is going to equal this product? Let's take the example of a velocity, which we know is displacement over time. And if we rearrange that, of course, we get that the displacement will equal the velocity times the time interval. So let's imagine that we've got an object that's moving at a constant speed of 5 meters per second and does so for 10 seconds. Then, of course, it's going to move 5 meters per second for 10 seconds. It's going to move by 50 meters. And, of course, 50 is the area under the graph. So it works for that instance. But what if the velocity is not constant? Well, let's suppose the velocity is changing, but the average velocity is still equal to 5. Then, of course, the area under the graph has got to be the same. So if you went at an average velocity of 5 meters per second for 10 seconds, you'd still go 50 meters. So we get this kind of simple situation. If we have two quantities that are a product of each other, and we plot one against the other, then the, then the area under that graph will equal the product. Here are four of the most common examples from physics where we use area under the graph. So if we've got a VT graph, then we know that displacement is equal to velocity times time. If we've got an AT graph, then we know that the change in velocity is equal to acceleration times time. If we've got an FT graph, then we know that the change in momentum is equal to the force times the time interval. And if we've got an F versus distance graph, then we'd know that the work would equal force times distance. So now all we need to do is calculate the area under each graph, and we'll find these four quantities. So in the first one, delta x equals the area would be 50 meters. In the second one, our area would be a half base times height. So our change in velocity would be a half of 10 times 10, or 50 meters per second. 
In the third instance, we're going to find out how much the momentum changed by. So we've got a momentum change of 3 times 5, 15 for this segment, and a momentum change of 7 times 5, 35 for the second segment. So our total change in momentum would be 50 kilograms times meters per second. And in the last instance, the work done will be equal to 4 times 5. So we've got an area here of 20, another area here of 20, and an area of a half times the height, 8 minus 4 is 4, times the base, which is 5. So 20 times a half would be 10. So our total area would be 20 plus 20 plus 10. And the work done would be equal to 50 joules. So that doesn't mean that every graph has an area under it of 50. But there are lots of different ways to get an area under a graph that is equal to 50. So please take the time to become a subscriber, or sign up for notifications, become a member, become a Patreon, make some comments, ask some questions. Any of your participation is greatly appreciated. Thank you. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.